I'll start off just by thanking Erez and uh, Tikhan Akali for putting together this amazing, amazing event. And we're going to dive into some incredibly deep Torah wisdom. And I want to start off with a story. And the story is of a man, we'll call him Shema, and he had a dream. And in that dream, he dreamed of a treasure that was buried in some far off country. And he woke up, thought nothing of it, but you know, Shimon was pretty poor and his life was pretty miserable. And he kept on thinking about that dream the entire day, but just said, you know, it's just a dream. And went back to his day. And then the next night he had the same dream. And the <laughs> the treasure is buried in the same exact place, and he's thinking, okay, this is getting a little weird, but it goes back to his day. And then the third night, he had the same exact dream. And after the third night, he's like, you know what? This treasure, he kept on thinking about exactly where it was located, located under some random bridge in some far-off country. And he said, you know what? I'm going. I'm going to go find that buried treasure. So he books a ticket with whatever money he has left, and he goes and he flies across the world, and he is there under that bridge, and he starts digging. And back goes mind, he's thinking, this is crazy, but then he's thinking, you know what? I might as well try. So he's digging away, digging away, and pff, someone knocks on his shoulder, turns around, security guard. Security guard says, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? This is public property. You cannot be here just like digging a hole. Uh, you know, what are you doing? And the guy's a little, you know, embarrassed, but he says, you know what? I don't think I'll, just, I'll just tell him the truth. So he tells the security guard, I actually I had a dream. And in that dream, I, I don't know how to really explain this in words that you'll understand, but there's a treasure buried right here. And I decided to book a ticket and come and unbury that, you know, buried treasure. And the security guard starts cracking up and says, you know, buddy, listen, if I listen to every dream that I had for the past couple of nights, I had a dream that on 234 Trestor Avenue, New Jersey, there's a buried treasure. You know, I'm not going to go all the way to New Jersey to go unbury that treasure. It was buried somewhere in the backyard. And Jim was thinking to himself, oh, my God, uh, that's my address. What's going on? So he actually... And it takes the first ticket back, goes to his backyard, and starts digging, digging away, and he finds the buried treasure. Now, there's a hundred different variations of this story, and it's a beautiful story, but it's a story not only as old as time, but it's the essence of Torah, which is that very often we go on this lifelong journey trying to find something, when really what we are yearning for and searching for is actually buried deeper within where we actually left off from the starting point. And it's the essence of Torah, which is that we are born in this world searching for something, but the way to find that is not necessarily to go further out, but to go deeper within. But the only way to go deeper within often is to take that journey further out. And it's a story of Torah, it's a story of Hanukkah. And it's the famous Gemara, the famous piece of Talmud that you are taught, kol Torah kul, all of Torah in the womb, and then the angel that taught you hits you on the mouth and you forget it, and the villain Lagoon and many deeper Bali Machshava Jewish thinkers explain that you didn't lose it, you lost access to it, and that Torah wasn't just kind of the simple explanations of Chumash and Rashi, it was the, the essence of life, the purpose of life, more importantly, your purpose in life. And the reason why you forgot it is because your job is to come into this world and unbury it, so to speak and to tap into who you truly are, but to go on the journey of becoming you. And what I want to do today is I want to delve into some of the deeper ideas of Hanukkah and some of the, the lights that need to be discovered, because the essence of Hanukkah is not only the physical light, you can see the menorah, it's not only the physical light that we're going to be lighting, as much as what's referred to in deeper Jewish light as the Or Haganas, the deeper hidden light that needs to be revealed, and delving deeper into thought, untapping our dormant inner world, tapping into higher consciousness, trying to understand exactly who we are, where we are, why we are. And we're also experiencing a very powerful stage in Jewish history, a stage where people are really fighting against everything we represent. And it's the anti-Semitism is as old as the Jewish story itself, but it's something that many people in you know, this generation didn't think would be possible for them to experience it the way that 
you know, our ancestors, my grandmother, uh, escaped from a death march from Auschwitz. And it's something we hear legends of stories that we didn't think that we'd be experiencing this in our lifetime, but we are. And I want to start off with a question, which is that whenever you read an amazing novel, you watch an incredible film, whenever you're engaged in some otherworldly experience that just captures your attention in a way that you've never really had before, you don't want it to end. Right? You want just you want that experience to just keep on going. And when you get to the end of the film, and you get to the end of the story, the end of the novel, there's a depressing feeling like you're being drawn back into space and time. And we don't want to. We want the story to continue. Now, where does that experience come from? And more importantly, why do we feel so sad? What, what is the sadness when a story is ending? And what's the Torah principle behind that? And how does that connect to Hanukkah? So what I want to do is I want to delve a little deeper into Hanukkah because I'm assuming that many of you know at least some of the introductory concepts when it comes to Hanukkah, and I'll review them, but I want to delve into a very deep idea. And the beginning of the story of Hanukkah is an ideological battle of two powerhouses when it comes to the fight for truth, the fight for true light, the fight for true wisdom, the fight for everything that's worth living for. And you have the Greeks who kind of an expression of the Aristotelian philosophy represented on the hierarchy of truth, the highest in the realm of, of natural wisdom, of mathematics, philosophy, politics, culture, uh, drama, the world of intellect, the world of human actualization. And they came to spread that light and they tried to wipe away Torah values, Torah thoughts by trying to essentially assimilate the Jewish people into the Hellenized culture of kind of mass Greek, uh, mass Greek takeover, so to speak, ideologically, philosophically, and culturally. And a few Jews stood up, Matasya and the the Maccabees, and they said, we're not going to stand by while you try to annihilate truth in the name of your truth. And we're going to stand up and we're going to fight. We're going to fight physically. We're going to fight spiritually. And the miracle of Hanukkah, the miracle of the menorah staying lit, it was the smallest open miracle in Jewish history. Then there was a, a very open hidden miracle of the few, the Maccabees, defeating the many. And the Maharal and many of the deeper Jewish thinkers, they explained that this was the essence of essentially a miracle where the miraculous transcended the natural, where the infinite transcended the finite, where the Jews were able to defeat the Greeks of old. And the question is, what's the deeper, what's the deeper battle here? What's the deeper battle of Hanukkah? Because on a very simple level, it's a story that we've heard countless times, which is essentially tapping into the miraculous, tapping into the light within the darkness, tapping into the inspiration that we all need to tap into. And we're in the dead of winter, the Jews are facing <laughs> a challenge that no one wants to face, but the challenges bring out the best of us, but at the same time, I want to understand the depth of this Hanukkah battle on a deeper level. And to understand it, let's kind of tap into what the Maral refers to as the battle of six, seven, and eight. So we live in a three-dimensional world. A three-dimensional world, if you look at a cube, it has right, left, Front, forward, up and down. That's six sides. But the seventh is that which connects those pieces together. So you can have six sides lying on the floor. The seventh always represents the connection of those pieces. So the natural world is built off of seven, right? There's seven days in the week. There's seven notes in the musical scale. There's seven lights in the, in the, kind of the, in the, the spectrum of light. But the eighth is always Lama Lama Natama. The eighth, as the Maharal explains, is that which transcends the natural. So when you have a radio, you have all the pieces, you put it together in the right way, but what ends up emanating, what you can receive when the pieces are together, is a radio frequency. When you have a human body that's healthy, it can receive consciousness. When you put the musical pieces together in the right way, you don't hear the musical notes, you hear music. And when those seven lights in the spectrum of light are actually reintegrated into origin, where do those seven lights or originate from? Right, white light. White light is refracted through a prism and expresses itself into multiplicity, but it stems back from that oneness. So eight is always the malam and Eight is always the transcendent. 
And this is really the essence of Hanukkah because Hanukkah is the holiday of light. And it's also the holiday of Torah. Now Torah literally comes from the root or light. And Torah was given, Ma'an Torah was on the first day of the eighth week, right? We count seven weeks of seven for Shri Omer, for counting from Pesach, Passover, till Shavuos, till Ma'an Torah, where we receive the Torah. And the 50th day, which is the first day of the eighth week, we receive the Torah. Bris Mila, as you take the most physical part of the human body and you uplift it to something spiritual and transcendent. And Hanukkah was a miracle of the last eight days. And what was a miracle essentially comprised of? It was comprised of shemen, oil. And shemen is the same root as shmona, which is eight, right? Sheva, seven is sevia, is to be full, to be satisfied. But shamein literally means fat, that which expands outwards. Shemen, oil, expands outwards transcendently. Shmona, eight, is that which connects to that which is transcendent. And the essence of Hanukkah is the battle between natural wisdom which is brilliant in all of its complexity. If you learn the world of philosophy and psychology and biology and physics, quantum mechanics, general relativity, and you go into these worlds of brilliance, there is brilliance here. Now that's what the Greek intellect represents. But at its root, if you're not connecting to the source of that wisdom, you're not tapping into true wisdom. If you're only remaining within the pieces and you don't go to something beyond, then you've actually limited the pieces themselves. So Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov represent the journey from the original inspiration of Avram, Avinu, Abraham, going on that journey into the unknown to the truth, Yitzchak solidifying it, Yaakov, Jacob being the, the, the father of the Shvatim, the 12 tribes, and kind of bringing in the birth of the Jewish people. We can delve literally hours and hours into what each of those pillars of Torah represent. Uh, Avram Chesed, Yitzchak Din, uh, Yaakov Teferis, and the brilliance, the wisdom behind that. And the question is, the question is, what is the real deeper battle with the Greeks? And I want to delve into that. Because Avram Avinu essentially went into the unknown. Avram Avinu went on this Lech Lecha journey where Hashem, God, didn't tell Avram where to go. He just told him where to leave from. And that's the real journey towards the truth, is being willing to journey into the unknown. Avram went on really two stages of that journey. One is a journey towards the ultimate, infinite, boundless truth and trying to figure out what the nature of reality is. And then his second stage of his journey was how to bring that infinite truth into this world and how to live a life of truth in this world. You know, the mitzvahs, if you, if you think about it, living a spiritual life should be a transcendent life. But the mitzvahs, the commandments, the essence of living a Torah life is living a transcendent life imminently in this physical, corporeal, limited, finite world. And that's why you can literally count the spiritual, intellectual mitzvahs on your hand, right? Believe in God, don't serve idolatry, don't be jealous. Almost every commandment is physical. Sheikh alulav, eat matzah. You know, wear it sits us, wear it fillin. You know, have a mezuzah. These are physical things. Why? Because living a life of truth is living a life of harmony of oneness, of seeing the infinite within the finite and seeing your ability to connect to the transcendent through living a transcendent life in this world. That's why we're not celibate, we believe in marriage. That's why we don't do away with wine, but we understand how wine, how yayin can be mekadish, can uplift that which is physical because living a transcendently imminent life and figuring out how to harmonize and integrate that which you think you'd have to compartmentalize and disconnect and either live a transcendent life or a physical life. But recognizing the, the fundamental synthesis between the two, that's the essence of Torah light. That's the essence of Torah life. And the Greeks represent the counter to that understanding of life. And the reason why is because the Greek story actually counters the Jewish story. You have Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Avram being much more trying to bring the infant into the finite Yitzchak, Gevura kind of reinforcing that, but also living a more transcendent life. And Yaakov uh, with Teferis blending, taking on his role and Esav's role after he left his role, and really blending those two together, living a transcendently imminent life, a life of oneness, of harmony, of Teferis, of synthesis. But the Greeks, they went on their own trajectory. Started with Socrates. They didn't start with Aristotle. Started with Socrates. And Socrates, the Socratic method, is to question everything. And Socrates' greatest strength was that he questioned everything in society but realized there was no answers. And he essentially, his 
principle of life was that the unexamined life is not worth living. And the Oracle of Delphi uh, claimed that he was the wisest man to live. And the reason why is because he admitted that he knew nothing. And there's a depth to that because the moment you think you know everything, you really, you really don't know anything. But the moment you, don't, you realize you don't know anything, in the deepest sense, as in you haven't fully grasped the depth of that which you think you know, you've opened yourself up to true knowledge, to true wisdom. But Socrates' strength was his greatest problem as well because he opened up every question, but he didn't find answers. And therefore, he was put on trial for corrupting the youth because if you question every paradigm, you question what, what is life, what is wisdom, what is uh, existence, what is the soul, what is meaning, what is happiness, what is purpose, what is consciousness, what is the intellect, what is a human body, what is marriage, what is male, what is female. If you open all concepts up, but you don't actually deepen them as much as you break them down and figure out that there is nothing behind them yet that you know, you've destroyed everyone's perception and paradigmatic realization of the life they have been living, but you haven't given them something to replace it with. And therefore, he was put on trial for corrupting society, for destroying the truth of the world. And they said, uh, essentially, apologize and admit you're wrong or we're going to kill you. And he gave up his life. And Yitzchak was willing to be most nefesh for the truth. And Socrates and Avram also was, and you know, classic Midrashim was willing to go into the Kishon Aish, a pit of fire, to sacrifice his life for what he believed in. But they were sacrificing their life for the truth. But Socrates was also willing to sacrifice his life for the truth. And the truth that he was willing to sacrifice his life for was that he didn't believe there was a truth because he hadn't discovered it. And instead of saying, uh, I was wrong and the truth that I have rejected is really true and I was wrong. He said, no, the truth that I have rejected, it's true to have rejected it because I'm searching for the truth, but I haven't yet found it. And I'm willing to give up my life for the fact that I don't yet believe that there is a truth to be found. And he was killed. And his star pupil, his Talmud Mufa, Plato, went on a life's mission of trying to solve that problem and discovering the deeper truth. And the Platonic model, the Platonic realm of ideas is a very deep system, whether it comes directly from Torah, is inspired by Torah, is a very deep discussion in terms of where the Greek ideas had actually came from. But he built a system which is not exactly as deep as the deeper Jewish thought system, but definitely parallels a lot of those deep meta-realities, deep meta-truths. And he built a very deep metaphysical system. And his, you know, the, the person who came after him, Aristotle, uh, basically took the infinite depth of Plato's system and concretized it and constrained everything to the realm of the human intellect. So the Ramban was famous for saying that everything that Aristotle couldn't understand, he rejected as not being true because anything that transcended the human intellect, which is, which is essentially constraining and containing and grasping things based on your human understanding. What that means is it has to be mathematically correct. It has to be organized. It has to be concretized. It has to be scientifically constructed. It has to be limited to the realm of truth based on their rules of what is true and what is not true. And that was Aristotle's greatest strength and greatest weakness is that he mastered human greatness and human truth, but nothing more than that. And then his star pupil was Alexander the Great who he tutored and essentially mentored. And then Alexander the Great went on a lifelong mission of kind of trying to make that Aristotelian Hellenized wisdom go viral. And it was a battle for the sake of truth. He tried to spread his light. And what ultimately ended up being manifested from that conquest was the Battle of Hanukkah. And the Battle of Hanukkah was a battle for truth. But here's what the real battle lies is that from a Greek perspective, from an Aristotelian perspective, the truth has already been closed. It's been discovered. The story has ended. We have already found the answers. Whereas the essence of Torah is that we have an infinite foundation of truth, but the progress and momentum and story of truth is endlessly unfolding. That is the story of Torah. It's the story of Judaism. It's the story that essentially never ends but it's endless and it's still within the, the realm of the spectrum of an actual genuine truth. And that's the essence of Torah Shabbat Peh, which is a Torah that is bounded within the infinite truth of Torah Shabbat the written Torah, but it's endlessly evolving. 
And that's why Rav Huttner explains that Hanukkah is the Chag of Torah Shabbat Pepe, because we didn't reject the, the Greeks and reject the intellectual truth. We actually rejected the Greeks, and it was the birth of the greatest transition where the Torah Shabbat Pepe, the intellectual growth of Klai Yisrael, enhanced and increased exponentially, which is the ultimate bell. We don't reject intellectual development, but we root it within something higher. We don't say, we don't reject the seven colors in the spectrum of light. We just root it in a white light. We don't reject the seven notes in the musical scale. We just connect it into a higher melody. And that's the beauty of time, is that also like anything finite, if you allow it to re reside within the realm of the finite, it becomes nothing. But if you can connect it to the infinite, it becomes everything. And that's why the Pach Shemen was the oil of the Kohen Gandal, right? That was one that wasn't Matame. It wasn't able to be ruined and purified by the Greeks. So the Greeks can only touch the realm of the seventh, the natural. But the Pach Shemen, the Kohen Gandal, who, who's the Kohen Gandal? He connects the transcendent in the most powerful way because where does the Kohen Gandal go? He goes into the Kosh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, on Yom Kippur. Because no human being is able to go into the Holy of Holies by Yom Kippur. We connect to our angelic selves that in the realm of the eighth, the infinite, the transcendent. And the Kohen Gadol represents us by going into a place where no one can go. And that's the, the type of oil, the Shemen, the Shemen, Shemona, the eighth, that was untouched by the intellect of the Greeks, the seventh. And that's why the holiday of Hanukkah lasted eight days. And that's why the essence of the, the, of the miracle was with Shemen tapping into that eighth, that transcendent. That's also why the miracle of the physical battle taps into the same concept, because the few only can defeat the many, not quantitatively, but qualitatively. When the few become essentially interconnected and synergistic, you can defeat a force that's high in number, but low in quality. That's why Yaakov says, actually, Kol, I have everything, representing the 50th. Again, the 50 is 49, seven weeks of seven, and then 50th is that eighth. Yaakov represents tapping into the ultimate infinite oneness, whereas Esav says, Yishli Rav, I have many. Reish Beis, 200, two numbers of two-ness, numbers of quantity, not quality. Not oneness, but two-ness. And Yaakov says, I have everything. Because when you are able to tap into the transcendent, you're able to do infinitely more. And the essence of Hanukkah is recognizing that the deeper Jewish story is trying to tap into living an infinite life within a finite world, living a transcendent life within an imminently corporeal existence. And we are mortal beings, and our bodies will die, but when you can tap into a higher light, a higher wisdom, and when you can tap into, tap into something more, you can defeat everything. And the, the Yavanim, the Greeks, Yavan Lili is Yud, Vav, Nun, Sofit, which is essentially a line getting deeper and it means quicksand, right? Because it gets stuck deeper and deeper into a physical existence and there's no escaping it once you get stuck there, unless you can tap into something higher and get essentially pulled out. And the essence of Hanukkah is overcoming the Greek gazeris, the Greek decrees, which were designed to disrupt and disconnect us from living a transcendent life, living a higher life. And the true battle of Hanukkah is trying to tap into this deeper story. And it's asking yourself, how can I try to live a more transcendent life with the limited time that I have in this world? And it's not a question of if you can, but the best way for you to do that. And that's really the essence of living a deeper life. It's like, if you look at the musical scale, the eighth note is actually the first note on the next level up. And living a higher, more meaningful life is not transcending the life that you have as much as uplifting it. Improving your marriage, improving your spiritual growth, improving your physical health, tapping into higher levels of consciousness, building uh, your ultimate relationships, becoming a leader, devoting your life to a mission, getting more self-aware, how to you know, improve not only financially, not only psychologically, not only physically, not only intellectually, not only spiritually, but on all fronts, building a harmonized interconnected, <coughs> excuse me, interconnected life. And there's no better life. There's no better way to live your life than to strive for the truth. And this truth is not simple. It's not choosing A over B. It's recognizing the importance of every piece of the puzzle. 
And that really brings us back to not only our opening story, which is that the real treasure in life is not going somewhere distant and outside, but going deeper within. The way you connect to Hashem is not going out into outer space and trying to find Him out there somewhere, but going deeper within yourself and deeper into the inner realm of your inner consciousness. And recognizing that Hashem is not only the source of your being and the consciousness, but the source of everything. And the more in touch you get with yourself, the more in touch you get with everything, everyone, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because there's hierarchies of the self. There's you, there's building a deeper relationship with yourself. There's delving even deeper in, in terms of like the shared self, in terms of building a marriage with your spouse. And there's delving deeper into yourself in terms of your expanded self with your family. Then there's the, the whole community of the Jewish people. And there's tapping into deeper and deeper realms of collective self and ultimately tapping into the recognition of Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God is the source of all self, of all existence, of all consciousness, of all meaning, of all purpose. And the more you can tap into that, the more you can infuse that within your own life. And that's the essence of Hanukkah. And the real story of Hanukkah is recognizing that the journey towards truth is endless. And where Socrates opened that up and, and Aristotle closed it off, the Jewish story is one of not only opening it up, but endlessly pursuing that journey and recognizing that there is no end. There's just the beauty of the journey towards it. And the Ramban would say that the tzaddik and the rasha, the righteous person, the evil person, they both see the endless journey towards the truth. And the rasha says, I'll never get there, so why, why even start? And the tzaddik, the righteous person, says, I'll never get there, but uh, let me take one more step closer towards it, and one more step closer. And the Gemara, Nida Dathama Mbe, says that when we learned all of Torah, when we were shown our purpose in life, that angel makes us take a, an oath, makes us swear that we're going to become a tzaddik. The question is, how can we, how can we become a tzaddik? And Rechana Wasserman explains, based on the Rambam, the Rambam, my man, he says that everyone can become a tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu. And Rechana Wasserman explains that it's not that you can become as great as Moshe, it's that Moshe actualized his unique potential, and tzaddik is someone who becomes the person they were supposed to become. And your job in life is to become that, and to go on that journey. And that's a journey towards light, towards wisdom, towards truth, towards purpose, towards meaning, towards real existential happiness, to actualizing your unique potential and helping as many people as you can do the same. And that's the real beauty of Hanukkah in the sense that the reason why we love engaging in the story, the hero story of being inspired and going on the journey and overcoming difficulties and recognizing the difficulties in your life are there to build you, not to break you. And that by, in order to literally build your muscle, you need to tear it apart. In order to build your existential, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, physical muscles, you need to go through challenges and struggles and you need to persevere and become stronger because of it. But that's a story that doesn't end. And the reason why we are kind of deflated and a little depressed when we come to the end of a great story, an amazing novel, an amazing film, is because we don't want the story to end. But that's the beauty of a great sequel, is that it's not the same story repeated, but it builds off of that previous story and takes it to the next level. And the Jewish story is an endless, it's, it's the ideal sequel concept, which is the, the same fundamental story of striving for greatness, striving for truth, striving to actualize your potential, but it's one that's progressed deeper and deeper and deeper. It's not a circle where we just keep on going back around, but it's a spiral as Ramchal puts it, where time is spiraling around and every single time we come back to this time in Jewish history of Hanukkah, we're not going back to memorize the past and, and kind, of, kind of, I wouldn't say memorize, but we're not remembering the past as much as we're building off of it. And the essence of the Hanukkah journey, the essence of the journey we're about to take, is recognizing that the journey towards the truth is endless. That's why the Gemara says that in Olam Hab and the world to come, Sadiqam are circling around HaKadosh Baruch Hu, circling around Hashem, pointing and, and, and kind of enjoying the deeper and deeper relationship, the deeper and deeper connection, the deeper and deeper understanding and experience of truth because it is an endless journey. And that's why the Gemara says that Sadiqim never rest even once they're dead. Because the essence of living a life of truth is not getting to the truth, but going on the journey towards it. And the moment you limit the truth to saying, I have it, you've destroyed it. And that's what the Greeks did. And the essence of Hanukkah is, it's the light of Torah, which is infinite, and it's understanding that to experience the finite journey of engaging on the journey towards truth is truly the most inspiring journey once you realize it's also infinite. 
so we should be inspired to tap into the essence of Hanukkah, into the light of Hanukkah, the light of Torah, of Ora, of delving deeper into ourselves, self-awareness, connecting to ourselves, to our family, to our community, to, to really spreading that light worldwide. And at a time in Jewish history where people are scared to be Jewish, where people are scared to spread their light, now is the time to stand up tall, to stand up proud, to recognize there's nothing more beautiful than living a life of Torah, living a life of Judaism, living a life of truth. But the, in order to live a life of truth, you have to aspire towards it. You have to really, you have to enjoy the process of growth. And growth is essentially the essence of life. And that's why Hanukkah is a process. And that's why like, even the fact that we found oil and it went for eight days and not one day, it's that it's not we didn't have any oil and all of a sudden, boom, it lasts eight days. It's that you built off of something and you made it more. And that's taking the finite and making it more infinite. And that's the essence of living a life of meaning and purpose is start with where you are. Start with what you have. Start with what you know. Start with where what you've been given. And don't say this is all I have, but don't say I have nothing. Recognize that your starting point is all you need. And all you need is all you need. And then make that more. Strive for more, build a vision, build, build a trajectory, and then go on that journey. And once you start going on that journey, you recognize that is the essence of life. So we should inspire to have the most inspiring Hanukkah imaginable, the most inspiring year imaginable, the most inspiring life imaginable. And that's the, the beauty of the journey, is that it's endless, but it's also finite. And to enjoy every step of the process while you're aiming for something infinite, 